Jim is the Edward William and J. Marr Gustel Professor of Education and Dean of the College of Education at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Now I know at UNC when you say somebody is distinguished professor or endowed professor goes, yeah, I have like 12 of those in my school. Um, in the College of Education at Illinois, we have two. <laughs> and the Gutskill professor is a campus level professor at, at Illinois. Um, and I always say that Jim is too humble to say that, uh, but Jim is the foremost authority on the history of African American education in the South and history of higher education uh, desegregation. He's done incredible work also in the history of public school desegregation and the history of African American school achievement in the 20th century. Um, has several books, but The Education of Blacks in the South, 1860-1935, which I figured out was published by UNC Chapel Hill <laughs> Press. Good win for us. Um, as I said yesterday in my comments, it's a book that has been called Seminal, a classic, and a must read. And I know many of you have held this book. I see Eric Hauk walking in the room with the book in his hand. Um, and this book, and of course, <laughs> Linda Stone, um, and this book has accumulated a number of accolades over the years, including the following 18, 1989 Outstanding Book Award by the Gustav Smyers Center for the Study of Bigotry and Human Rights in North America, 1989 Critics' Choice Award, American Education Studies Association, and 1990 Outstanding Book Award from the American Education Research Association. Jim continues to serve as senior editor of the History um, of Education Quarterly, and he served as an advisor for and participant in the PBS documentaries, School, The Story of American Public Education, 2001, The Rise and Fall of Jim Crow, 2002, and Forgotten Genius, The Percy Julian Story of 2007. Jim has served as expert witness uh, in a series of high-level federal segregation and affirmative action cases, including um, Jenkins versus Missouri, Knight versus Alabama, Ayers versus Mississippi, Gratz versus Bollinger, and Grutter versus Bollinger, a bunch of those. Um, he was elected to the National Academy of Education in 2008. In 2012, he was elected as a fellow for outstanding research by the American Education Research Association and received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Association of Colleges of Teacher Education. In 2013, he was selected Center for Advanced Study Professor of Education Policy Organization Leadership at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and he always jokes about sitting at the Advanced Center for Advanced Study talking to people who kind of invented the atom or something <laughs> like that. It's like a very prestigious uh, fellowship on the Illinois campus. One thing I wanted to uh, sort of ensure is to speak about Jim's impact, which goes beyond scholarly domains. Um, he has had a tangible and substantial impact on the education and well-being of school su students and their families. Jim was the plaintiff's key expert in Jenkins versus State of Missouri, a case that goes back to, to 1984, and a, a case with a very complex history, as I read about it, because <laughs> it started actually in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. And Jim's testimony, which drew on his historical scholarship, was pivotal to winning the case. What this case resulted with, I'm sure many of you know, was $500 million in funding to the Kansas City School District and Department of Housing and Urban Development in the city to start to address some of the historical injustices that were suffered by minority students, mostly African American in this case, and their families as a result of discriminatory practices related to segregation against those students and their families. And that goes to speak about the importance of historical scholarship and philosophical scholarship um, as we continue to pursue equality, equity, and social justice in the um, US. One point in time I did ask Jim, it's like, you're a sort of a star witness <laughs> in all of these cases. How do you keep a straight story? And what Jim said was, you work hard, you find the facts, and you stick to them. That's the only way to keep your story straight across all of this work. And for those of you who, who missed his talk yesterday, I strongly encourage you to see the videotape. And um, we're going to take your permission. We can either put it as password protect protected or put it out there for the world to see. <laughs> but um, the length of historical scholarship 
that Jim engages with is nothing but exceptional and amazing. The work that goes into getting to establish those facts, getting to dig through um, election records um, from the 1860s or reading transcripts of debates on the floors of the Senate to try to understand, as he did yesterday, the long shadow that we still are living under right now, which is a result, a direct historical result of issues that are yet to be resolved in our nation is incredibly important. I really <coughs> encourage you to go and um, work with this. Um, I always also like to quote these figures which I think are very important because Jim's 50 year on the 50 <laughs> years on the Illinois campus, one third of uh, Illinois is 150. <laughs> he was, um, I think, 13 when he joined. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, that cl um, clean it up a bit. <laughs> is that better? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, when I was at Illinois, we always boasted the, these figures, but actually it was Jim's work over the decades that got us there. Um, and I always give these two figures. Um, um, I'm thinking 2010 maybe, but I'm mistaken, but maybe um, later than that. Uh, Jim's own Department of Education Policy Organization and Leadership graduated 10 African-American females with a PhD in a single year. We called them back then the fabulous 10. Um, and on the Illinois campus when I was there, there are 2,000 faculty members. And Illinois boasts being the most diverse of the Big Ten which are 15 universities, go figure out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the College of Education in its heyday, we were about anywhere between 90 and 100 faculty. And the diversity of the faculty in the College of Education at Illinois accounted for 20% of the diversity on the whole Illinois campus. Just figure the things out. And Jim has always talked about the long haul, how much time, energy, over decades that you need to do to build this kind of diversity. Um, and while we all boasted this, all of us knew that the backbone to this work came um, also from Jim. The other thing I do want to say is, um, and I always told Jim this, if Jim Anderson um, charged me a dime for every time I went to him for advice, he would be a very rich man. <laughs> <laughs> and if everyone that asked Jim for advice um, charged uh, was charged 10 dimes, he would be a very, very rich man. Um, Jim is incredibly generous with, with his time. And seriously, countless times from being an assistant professor at <coughs> Illinois all the way to being a department head and to being associate dean, um, uh, I would always go to Jim. And you know, I would be probably coming with what I thought was an incredibly uh, difficult problem or something that would require a nervous breakdown and and Jim would sit me down and he starts with a smile and that's when you know like things are gonna be okay <laughs> just just sit down and, and things gonna be okay I'm gonna remind you of, remind him of one thing I don't know whether he recalls because as as I said um, he gave me a lot of advice over the years but shortly as after I became department head he came to my office and sort of he sat me down in, in the chair and he said you have to realize something moving forward it is not about you. It's about that chair. If you're the object of praise, anger, discontent, all kind of stuff, you have to realize it's not about you. It's not personal. It's about the chair. I don't know if you recall that. <laughs> um, but you know, at that point, I figured out that's very important. You know, Jim is saying that, so it has to be important. But it really <laughs> came incredibly <coughs> handy over the years in trying to understand what it means to be in a uh, position of leadership and trying to keep these two things straight. Um, because it is important to understand that if you take those positions maybe too seriously to start with, but too personal, you can really do very, very little. So Jim, I want to thank you for all that advice over, okay. over the years. Um, and the reason Jim is, is here, because it was great to see him, but you recall that after the events of Charlottesville, after the very difficult discourse that started and continues to happen on this campus um, in relationship to our Confederate monument in this really divisive political terrain that we're living in in the US. As a school, we decided that we need to do what we do best was to continue to engage scholarship and engage in discourse, engage in research, engage in thinking around how we could negotiate 
this very difficult environment that we are in. And so um, we thought that Jim would be an incredibly well-qualified person <laughs> to come to us and talk about these issues. And I know that the doctoral students as well, um, we've talked to them and provided them with some support to sort of continue this series of talk for this year. So we really look forward to uh, Jim's comments today. I know he'd be looking um, also to some questions following his remarks. Uh, I know that some of you might have to leave by one because you have to run to classes. But if some of you want to stay after one and engage Jim with more questions, he's ready to do that because we told him today we're going to work him hard. Okay. So please <laughs> join me in welcoming Jim Anderson. Thanks for that wonderful introduction and thanks for the invitation. Um, I am very pleased to be here. Uh, any college of education anywhere in the country is home. I always feel home when I'm with uh, fellow uh, educators and aspiring educators. Um, it's the work that I love to do um, and where I really feel that I can make my best uh, contributions. I um, probably need to update my bio a bit. Uh, I'm no longer editor of the History of Education Quarterly, um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, good at these kinds of things um, and I always try to tell my students graduate and undergraduate that when it comes to this new digital era the one person you don't want to be like it's me <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, on the other hand to stress the importance of that you do not want to leave any place in particular college of education today without this expertise um, and I had an occasion here where I was at Foo Arts for dinner and his son was standing there and I mentioned something about YouTube <laughs> and it took me about 10 seconds to realize he knows a lot more about YouTube <laughs> than I do. I didn't know you could even delete stuff on YouTube and he was telling me how to do it, how to copyright, how to do this and so I turned to Foo Arts and said does he have his own, he, no, 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 we don't allow him to have his own copyright yet. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about it this way is that we are now educating teachers to go into schools where these are the kind of kids that they have to teach. They never lived in a world without an internet, without a smartphone, without understanding YouTube and Facebook. And you know, I, I don't have a Facebook, but um, well, I, I should say, uh, some of my graduate students decided they would create one on my behalf <laughs> without telling me. Kind of funny how that worked out. Um, it was like a tribute. So my college classmates, I went to Stillman College, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, it's historically black college. My college classmates figured that, well, he's passed. <laughs> <laughs> so they started to write each other, isn't it a shame? You know. <laughs> well, one of them, he was not exactly in the freshman class with me, but he was, uh, he was um, a junior when I was a freshman who was actually working at Illinois at the same time. He was our vice chancellor of administration. And he got the message saying, you know, we sorry to hear the news that he passed. <laughs> so he, he's, and he said, well, I just saw him yesterday. I mean, <laughs> so I couldn't figure out what happened here. He said, well, they, they, they saw it on your Facebook. I said, I don't have a Facebook. <laughs> so I get back to the college and I see my graduate students and I was like, did you guys? They said, well, yeah, we, we did put up a Facebook uh, tribute to you. I said, well, did you make it clear <laughs> as long as I'm living <laughs> that you put on the Facebook, Facebook that he's still alive? <laughs> so, <laughs> but, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's I'm a, I'm a, as a, as, as, uh, in some ways a dinosaur, but quite a promoter. I mean, one of the things that I'm building on in the College of Education, who I started that with the group that we call Delta, it really looks at the digital learning era and the kinds of training that our teachers need. And we have uh, quite a cadre of people. And then we now in the process of hiring three new people so that we have strong capacity in this area. Um, it's going to be difficult when you think about because I think this has much to do with uh, inequality because inequality is dynamic. It's forever changing. And so what inequality was like 40 years ago or 50 years ago is going to be different going forward um, as we uh, do more in the way of online education as well as MOOCs 
and um, and and the whole digital learning experience. Um, how will that reach all of the kids? How will that reach kids? When I think about Illinois, how will that reach kids in the city of Chicago, in the city of East St. Louis, or Rockford, or Peoria, as opposed to Highland Park, or DuPage, and, and Winnick, and places like that? Will we get a new kind of inequality? Um, I know <clears throat> that we have um, 26 states now have required, uh, put in the requirement that all high school graduates must complete a course in computer science. Mm -hmm. yeah. And my first thought was, where did we train the teachers to teach computer science? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when did that happen? You know, and I know we're not training them in our college at this point. Um, somebody's doing it. And I'm thinking, but do we have this vast army of teachers out there at the secondary level can make sure that what our students get is not some antiquated coding? but some expertise that we actually can call computational thinking, computer science. Uh, well, we have to think about doing that. And we have people there. I have interesting conversations with faculty because I asked once, I said, well, why aren't they teaching our teachers? And the response I got was, well, they, they never taught in the K-12 system themselves. Mm -hmm. And so my response was, you know, I teach over at the Correctional Center in Danville, but I have never been in an inmate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have to get past this notion that there are certain kinds of expertise that people have now that our teachers really need and it doesn't matter whether they, I mean, they can work with teachers and they can work with other educators who understand pedagogy and teacher techniques, but we can't wait for everyone who have this expertise to have actually been a K-12 teacher. Um, we have to uh, equip uh, people with this expertise, um, we have one of our persons that that does work on collaborative learning, for instance, uh, was not a teacher at K-12 system, but certainly a very useful digital learning techniques that teachers can use. And so we have to prepare to make sure that we don't get a new kind of inequality. But let me kind of roll back because it was sort of looking at education in uncertain times and a lot of things. One. <clears throat> I think there are things at different levels. I want to start at the national level and then I want to think about the things, I always think about the things that we can control as a college of education. Because uh, I think the thing that we can control most is the quality of teachers that we produce. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's the thing that we can work with districts and states on uh, also controlling. I never forget reading the ETS study on parsing the achievement gap. And they pointed out in that study that one third of all African American Latino students in America take math from teachers who weren't trained in math. And I thought, well, that's the answer right there. If the teachers don't know mathematics, then why do we expect them to do well on the ACT and SAT in these areas where you need an understanding of it? Uh, so here's something that we, with districts and states, can control to make sure that all of our students have quality teachers that they learn from in these areas. But <clears throat> let me start. I have some concerns about the national and the national commitment and really to ask the question for educators, for students, for teachers, um, and for politicians and businesses that do we have the will as a nation to really improve the quality of education? And I think the will question is really important. And I'll just give a couple of examples. One, um, I, would, I used to read the, the GAO, General Accounting Office reports. And one of the reports they did for Congress was on facilities and the, the equipment and American schools. And this was like um, 10, 15 years ago. And at that time, the General Accounting Office said to the U.S. Congress that you need to put in a minimum, at that time, a hundred billion dollars to bring American schools up to standard. And they had this huge report and they went to places like Detroit and Chicago and other places and they had pictures of schools that were ceiling falling down. And they said, the, the, the wiring can't even bear the internet. And so if we're gonna keep pace on a global scale uh, with other countries, we have to uh, make these kinds of changes. And then we didn't. And then came, and I'm, I'm sure it's been part because it was Obama, but in the stimulus package, if you call it, the first stimulus package, there was $20 million in there for the rehab of American schools. Yeah. On these very things, asbestos, 
you know, wiring and things like that. And there were a couple of senators from New England who said, you got to take that out if you want the stimulus package to pass. You can keep the stuff in for Chrysler and drone motors and all that. And you can bail out these things, but you can't bail out American schools because it is not a federal responsibility. It's a state responsibility. And at the time I thought that's kind of peculiar because if I am correct, we are using federal money to build schools. So I went to the Department of Defense page and there they were celebrating having just built 1,000 new schools in Iraq. I was like, well, now wait a minute. We have the will to use federal money and federal troops to build schools here, but we can't do it in Detroit or Cleveland or places like that. They have to continue to be run down in ways like that. That's why I'm talking about the national will. In the way we, we let that will go where we actually see American education is more than an intellectual thing that everybody can agree to. It ought to be good teachers and good schools and so forth to the point where you actually have the will to put in the decisions and the legislation to do something about. And recently the, we had uh, in Illinois uh, two legislators, a Democrat and Republican came out concerned about the teacher shortage because there were 6,000 jobs that went unfulfilled in Illinois last year, 100,000 in the nation. And I thought, great. We have a bipartisan group. So we contacted them to set up a meeting this March so they could come to the College of Education and let's talk about what the state can do. I had in mind things like forgivable loans and other sorts of things to reduce the cost of preparation. <laughs> and they sent back this week while I was out of town. Now we can't meet now, let's do it this summer. And I thought, okay, just what kind of will do we have here? What kind of sense of urgency do we have about what needs to do, what we need to do in American schools? And let me just take a moment to contrast an experience. I was in China. This was in, uh, I almost said 1898, but <laughs> 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 historians make those slips every now and then. <laughs> <We're not there. laughs> it, it was actually 1998, and I was in, um, and, and and I was meeting with a lot of Chinese educators and officials at the time. And they wanted my reaction to their plans and what they want to do. And I said, what are you going to do? And they said, first of all, we're going to create a socialist market economy. And I said, that's a contradiction in terms, isn't it? And they said, no, we're going to have 50% of the businesses owned by the government and 50% private enterprise. They said, but what we really need to do is we really need to change education in Shanghai because we need Shanghai to drive, the engine to drive the economy in Western China. So we need to invest in that. Remember like two or three years ago on the PISA exam, who scored number one in the world? Shanghai. Yeah. Now I know democracy doesn't work quite that way, quite as efficient where you can have a five year plan and, 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 and execute it, but that will that sense that we need to make these changes and we're going to make these changes and we're going to put together the kinds of resources and the kind of systemic effort and the organization and not stop until it's done uh, is something that we need in this nation uh, and we need leverage at all levels. We need leverage at the grassroots level for the parents. We know, how, we know what the demographics are like. We know that uh, the majority of our students are going to be black and brown students. Um, that's always the case in places like Illinois and Texas already in California. Uh, those parents need to be really concerned about what kind of education their kids are going to get. Um, and I always say uh, when people bring this up, I said, just remember, we're talking about two populations here that you can't think of any point in American history where they were equal in terms of education results. It's not a new thing, achievement gap. I said the achievement gap was there in the 19th century, 18th century, 1920, 1950. The achievement gap has been there for a long time. In fact, it's better now than ever. I don't know if you've seen the Economic Policy Institute study of the last 50 years, and they have a section on educational attainment. And things are actually improving when people say, well, nothing ever changes. So it's good to look at that. But there are a lot of issues on inequality in these times that are not changing. Um, and a couple or so that I think we can, I mentioned, uh, how we need to have uh, this uh, approach in digital learning to make sure uh, that all students. The rigor, the curriculum that, that kids get, 
uh, let's just take AP courses as an example. Um, in Illinois, <clears throat> I decided to take a look at what kids could get in East St. Louis or Chicago versus Highland Park. So I went to the college board, looked at Highland Park, one of our uh, really top public school systems in the, in the state. The AP courses went into the second page. And I went to East St. Louis and they had one. And I thought, both of these schools are graduating seniors who are trying to get into the University of Illinois as freshmen. And there's no contest here. There is no way that these students are going to compete with these students from Highland Park. That inequality is there, it's structured, but we, one we can change. Um, and I'm working with the University of Illinois. <coughs> um, I'm actually serving advisor on their uh, online and MOOC committee. So, uh, there was a time in our history where we'd have to have people to go and make these changes, but we now have online as a way to level the playing field. There is no reason why those students in East St. Louis can't go online and have the course with the same kind of rigor and demand that students in other parts of the state have. And I notice in our state, for instance, when I look at, you know, I, and, I, and, and, and I would say up front that when it comes to private schools, Catholic schools, charter schools, my main hope is that all of them just do a good job. Uh, and, but at the same time, when I look at Illinois, if I go to the Illinois State Board of Education and look at charter schools and go to the city of Chicago, it's, they're going forever. Charter schools, charter schools, charter schools, charter schools. I go to Highland Park, zero. I go to Winneka, zero. Naperville, zero. Yeah. And I'm asking myself, why are those charter schools in places like this? Well, because they have great public high schools. So are we giving up the hope that we could ever have great public high schools in a place like Chicago? Well, we're going to have to, because there'll never be enough charter schools or private schools to accommodate the kids. Chicago has 340,000 students in its district. And 90% of them will go to public schools. And if we're going to give those kids half a chance to have a good career, to go to college or go from high school into transition into <coughs> workplaces with a decent education, we're going to have to improve the quality of public education in that system. And I'm trying to, certainly with our College of Education, we are trying to have an impact in Chicago. Much of it is online, um, and much of it actually for the first time having meetings with the Dean of Education at UIC, which we never had before to say, look, <laughs> you know, we both have a common interest here to make sure that these kids get a good uh, quality education. So that's one area of inequality in these times that we actually can control and we actually can make a difference in. Another, um, you know, I remember reading these studies by Harper that came out of the University of Pennsylvania on suspensions and expulsions. It's shocking, absolutely shocking. He was looking at mostly the American South, and he was looking at school districts in where 100% of the kids that were suspended or expelled are African Americans. You go, 100%? You mean by chance? You couldn't get someone else just by luck of the draw? <laughs> <laughs> and so, what does that remind us of? You know, that there's this implicit bias that operates within our system that we as colleges of education can change because we can put that into the training of uh, education of our teachers, where, you know, <clears throat> if we know that something is going to happen out there, and we do know that, and that's on a number of levels, it even happens at the higher education level. I just, I'll just digress for a moment, but <clears throat> uh, there was a study that was done of faculty committees that were hiring new faculty, and they simply had manufactured resumes. And the only thing you knew that were female names and male names. Gave them the same credentials, the same elite institutions, the same accolades, the same awards. And when they ranked them, the women were ranked consistently lower. The surprise in the study was that the women on the search committees also ranked the women lower. Which reminds us of how viral uh, uh, an implicit bias can be. That you, well, somehow we are socialized to think that these should be on top or these are safe. 
And so in this area of suspension and expulsion, the Yale study, that's one of you know, that came out, where they took 125, 126 teachers, they put them behind a glass where they could see four students, a black boy, black girl, white girl, white boy, and simply said, watch them to make sure they don't get in any trouble. But what the teachers didn't know, they had this eye gauge to know where their eyes would go. And 45% of the time was watching an African-American boy who did nothing wrong. But the presupposition was that if someone here is likely to do something wrong, it's going to be that African-American boy. So we need to keep an eye on him. Now, they told the teachers afterwards, and the teachers were kind of shocked at what they did. And then they decided to have workshops, and all but one actually agreed to be in the workshops to deal with implicit bias. So whether it's hiring at the faculty level in higher education, or whether it's looking at kids. Now, these were pre-K kids. I think the shocking thing about the Yale study was I didn't know something like 50% of all the pre-K kids that are suspended and expelled in the, in the U.S. are African-American. I was like, I went to school in Alabama, there's no way they was, you would get out lucky with a suspension. Uh, <laughs> other things might happen to you if you were that young, but, but I thought, really, are we really suspending that many kids in, at that age? Uh, because, we, so these, can we actually, as we educate, uh, teachers are educators, can we actually deal with this sort of implicit bias that have a pretty uh, um, negative and adverse impact on students. And if it's there at that level of expansion and expulsion, what about the expectations of students when teachers go into classrooms? How do we also <coughs> deal with those kinds of implicit biases that they might <coughs> carry in? Because if you don't believe in the potential of these students, they're the first one to recognize when you don't expect them to do something. And once they recognize that, they almost defy you to teach them <coughs> because they don't trust you to teach them if you don't think that they have the capacity to be great uh, and to have potential that needs to be uh, brought out. And I learned that very quickly um, when I started teaching that that, is, that trust factor is very critical. So there's no reason that we can't deal with this as colleges of education as we um, uh, look at the kinds of inequities that we actually can control, that we actually can change. Um, <clears throat> I think we can play somewhat of a role in dealing with what is a shortage in America, teachers, um, but here's the dilemma. We have 36 states in which teachers can't afford a middle class living now. That's why the West Virginia thing is underway. And Part of that is the debt that they carry once they finish their education that they have to spend the rest of their life trying to pay off. The debt is over a trillion dollars or so. To the time when we came through with no debt. Yeah. Now, there are things that we can do to try to work with, whether it's foundations, whether it's state governments, whether it's federal governments. Can we reduce the cost of preparation so that we can keep high quality people in the field so that they can feel they can have a decent standard of living and not have to leave uh, because of that. Uh, when I went to Illinois for graduate school, and the only way I could have gone is I did not finish my undergraduate in education, it was in sociology. The faculty at Stillman was more than happy to remind me that as a freshman they told me that I should get a teaching certificate so I would have something to fall back on. Think about that phrase, to fall back on. And my major was mathematics at the time, and I said, well, I'm not going to need anything to fall back on. <laughs> so there I was a senior without a job, and they were like, oh, I know you're going to need something to fall back on. <laughs> <laughs> so the placement director came to me and said, look, Illinois has this graduate program. And I said, I can't afford to go to graduate school. He said, oh, no, 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 they have NDEA fellowships if you get admitted. Remember the National Defense Act fellowships? Because the, the federal government at the time felt there were so few teachers and the shortage was so great that they had fellowships specifically to bring into education those undergraduates and the humanities and social sciences that did not major in education as undergraduate. I remember the place the director said, the Lord designed this for you. <laughs> 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 and 
<laughs> and I applied, not thinking anything would happen, but they accepted me, and I went to graduate school five years, not a penny of debt, the fellowship, is that we have to work with government, state, federal, to say, look, we're at that point again. Those shortages, and those shortages lead to inequalities, because when there's a shortage, them that got, them that don't, we know how that works out. We really don't have to go into details here. Um, <clears throat> you know, places like Chicago and other places there, rural areas as well, by the way. That's another thing I keep reminding people in Illinois. I said, it's not only East St. Louis that doesn't have these AP courses. There are a lot of rural schools also that don't have them. They don't even have AP qualified teachers. You know? And I think I was looking to see, why can't we do some of that online? And I think the only college or university that I saw that have an online program to qualify AP teachers is San Diego State University, I believe. Um, <clears throat> and they work with the college board. Uh, it's kind of, I think we can do a lot of, uh, I looked at that, I said, that's something to gain here, because they're charging like $2,500 um, for whatever, uh, per course, I forget what they're charging just to get qualified as AP and you don't get a master's degree. And I thought, oh my, why don't we couple AP qualification with a master's degree uh, and, and offer that at the same time? That could be something that's very attractive because these schools need AP teachers. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I'm looking at it as a dean now. I was like, hey, we might have a market here. <laughs> but uh, I think the main thing is to say, look at these rural areas where these kids do not have these kinds of opportunities. Look at Chicago. They have a lot more in common than we think. A place like Chicago and their rural areas in Illinois. Uh, and then we also recognize that these areas are changing. So teachers who normally would go into these areas expecting a certain kind of classroom can't expect it anymore. We have a place named Arcola, Illinois. And I was looking at, uh, I'm always looking at uh, enrollment in school statistics on the Illinois State Board of Education. I thought Arcola, Illinois has 36% Latino. Now, that didn't make no sense at all. I was like, for one, if I was going to come anywhere in America, I would not be headed to Arcola, Illinois. <coughs> well, Arcola just happens to be the broom-making capital of America. And they're coming in to make those brooms. And their kids have now come to be 35% of the district school population. Yeah. So Arcola has created a soccer team <laughs> that they never had before. But I'm thinking about the education side, the academic side. You know. What about teachers going in? What about the bilingual skills that they need now to go into Arcola? What about issues of cultural diversity and implicit bias, all kinds of things that they now would need? Uh, it used to be, and the suburban areas, by the way, are changing very fast. They're becoming more desegregated right before our eyes. There's no longer you know, segregated suburbs in America. And so what kind of um, uh, teachers we need to train now to know that they're going into the Arcolas, into the segregated suburbs, into Chicago, and wherever their classrooms are, we need to equip individuals that feel confident that they can handle those kinds of situations. And I think as colleagues, we can put a lot of that into the education. Um, I know how difficult it is working at Illinois. When every time you talk about a change, it's, oh, we can't change anything because the state mandates this and the state mandates that and the state and in the first place, the state had no idea what it's mandating. Uh, <laughs> if I went over to the state and said, what are you mandating to teach education? You know, and they, I know we passed some regulations and just make sure you comply. Uh, yeah, we need to rethink some of these things and rethink the curriculum and the preparation in a way and uh, not have to spend our time in subterfuge to trying to subvert standards, but really going boldly to say, if our goal is a common goal to educate the kinds of teachers that are going to go into our schools and do an outstanding job, then let's think about the kinds of mandates and the kinds of requirements. Now, my, my, my personal preference for places like this in Illinois, you know, I don't know how much of a mandate we need. We have the kind of quality of people who know what we need to do in education. Um, and um, the mandates that have come, we have uh, Sometimes the unintended consequences make more sense than the intended consequence. I know Illinois at one point required all of the, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure whether it was ninth grade or whatever, to take the ACT. That's just mandated. Well, it turns out there were a lot more uh, black and Latino students in the state that would score higher on the ACT than they otherwise would know. 
And so it was like, whoa, look at the byproduct of this. Now, <coughs> here's another thing we can do. Um, when I was looking at the college board and the results, and it goes, some people say, well, why, why AP courses? I was looking at the college board. You know why we score in the world on the international test of math and science. We're down there with, what's that nation, Cyprus? Uh, <laughs> we're running neck and neck like 24, 25 with Cyprus. <laughs> on the college board, <laughs> here's what they report. For American students who take AP physics and score at least a three on the exam, score number one in the world, on the Thames test in physics. And for American students that take AP mathematics, irrespective of the examination score, they score number one in the world. So when they disaggregate their students from the rest of, of us, you know, uh, you know, raking talent from the rubbish, I guess, is to use Jefferson phrase, um, when they disaggregate their students, it becomes clear. And I don't think that it's the AP, it's just that when you take those rigorous and demanding kinds of courses, you're much more prepared to do well on those kinds of examination. I would be pleased if they declared a moratorium on a lot of standardized tests. But states are not about to do that. You know, they are going to mandate that. And when the results for high school graduates is that you think you're not prepared to go to college, you're not college ready because your score is so low, then we have to think about ways uh, to improve the kind of demanding curriculum they go through and the kind of performance. And particularly when we are now projecting that the jobs of the future will require those kinds of skills, um, that, uh, um, that that's where corporate America is going. That's where um, the jobs are going. Not all of them, but the majority of the jobs going to be in areas that require those kinds of mathematical computational skills. Now, I'm from the humanities side, a historian. I still think we need to do a lot in music and art education because my view is that um, there are a lot of students whose talents only come out in certain arenas. I had a student once from Atlanta. She was in Champaign, did a doctor dissertation. I'll stop shortly, by the way, because I want to get make this much more inactive. But anyway, she took, she followed African American kids from school to church. That was a dissertation, same group. She would look at them in school, <coughs> and they would have problems, suspension, <coughs> expulsion, demerits, and other kinds of things. Then she's and, and very quiet and very uh, withdrawn, sometimes alienated. Then she go to church, and then there was this outburst of activity from singing to testifying to speaking out, and she kept going back and forth. And the question she had was, why would these students have such active participation in this arena? Same students and be so quiet or alienated or withdrawn <coughs> in this context. I think the same thing is true for curriculum as well. There are some areas of curriculum, it could be music, um, some ways that bring students out. I don't know if you follow what is called cur curriculum with KO. Uh, you ought to take a look at it because I was watching this <coughs> and he uses rap music. So he had this group of middle school African-American boys, and he says, okay, the question is how to write an essay. I said, I want to watch this, because I never met a human being that was excited about writing an essay <laughs> at the middle school level, or the high school level, or even the college for me. You know, it's like how to write an essay? You know, the, the excitement is how to get out of writing an essay. <laughs> so he asked them, what's an essay? And all they could say was, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And then he goes through this rap thing about an essay. And then he goes and questions him again. The first thing that struck me was they remembered every word that he said. And I thought, when I was in high school and the teacher gave a talk on how to write an essay, probably 90% I would not remember. And it's not because they're interested in essay, because they are in a medium where they always remember every word that's said. <laughs> if you can't remember every word in the rap music, you're probably not cool. <laughs> yeah. And they did. And then when he questioned them, the sophistication had improved on the spot about that. 
My point is that we need to look at different mediums to bring out the potential in our young people and prepare our teachers to do that. I mean, it's one thing to say, well, you know, computational thinking, math, these kinds of things, but the human, the, the students that we teach are much more complex and the range of that potential cut across so many areas um, that we need to really think about how to tap into different things to bring that uh, potential out. So at this point, um, um, you know, I'll close by saying we are in uncertain times and we do need the kind of leadership that we don't have you know, at so many levels. Uh, and uh, um, in the absence of that, we can't wait on it. It's what we do over the things that we can control and over the communities that we can connect with um, and the message that we should send uh, to parents and students about how, yes, how to organize around the improvement of education um, and, um, uh, and, and specifically as we prepare educators principals, superintendents, and teachers to go out into the field, what do we need to do to make sure that they can take on the challenges that we know are there to meet them? For the record, I made it clear to my son Kareem, and I'm old fashioned, that YouTuber is not a career. So <laughs> <laughs> channel. So um, let's open up for some questions, please. Yes. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, mm -hmm. um, desegregation was a, a big policy goal, mm -hmm. and it seems like, especially <coughs> since No Child Left Behind, that's been replaced by. Um, <coughs> raising test scores of segregated schools instead of actually trying to integrate schools. Mm -hmm. Why do you think desegregation has, has stopped being part of policy discussions? Well, I think primarily a lot of the court decision constrained in deseg. Um, the first one was Millican versus Bradley, when the Supreme Court ruled that you can't cross district lines to desegregate schools, even if the suburban areas have been part of contributing to the kind of segregation that actually existed. And this was the Kansas City case that I was involved in. There was about 16 suburban school districts that were involved in that. It was clear to me as a historian, um, and I did want to comment early uh, why when you go as an expert witness, you really need to stick to the facts because the other side, their dream is that you would somehow fudge the facts, somehow tail of the evidence for a, a, a legislative outcome because they couldn't wait to cross-examine you and demonstrate to the court that you are a stock naked fool. <laughs> I mean, that's the uh, thing. When I was in the witness stand and I heard the judge says, okay, it's your turn to impeach the witness. I'm like, impeach? <laughs> so, but anyway, what, what we learned there was that there was only one high school in the metropolitan area. It was Lincoln High School in Kansas City. And every suburban school district sent their African-American kids at the high school level into Lincoln to get a high school education. And then for African-American parents, when Lincoln became overcrowded and said, no, we got a limit to people in the district, even the landowners sold their land and moved into Kansas City and moved in areas close to the high school so their kids could get a high school education. And this synergy between the suburban communities and Kansas City to segregate those schools was quite obvious. The judge decided because of Middleton versus Bradley to sever the suburban districts. And so that was one major blow to desegregation when you couldn't cross district lines. And then came a series of cases by the Supreme Court. And I think the last salvo was Meredith uh, case in Louisville and the Seattle cases in which the Supreme Court said, you simply cannot use race to assign students to schools. Well, <clears throat> if you can't use race to assign students to school, that's gonna put significant constraints on efforts. Because in Louisville, it was voluntary desegregation. It was very popular. It was supported by the parents and by the city. And they said, no, this violates the constitutional rights of these kids. Uh, same thing in Seattle. Uh, so I think we've seen a series of court cases. And there were some other cases in the 1990s where they constantly 
close the the, the, the door on opportunities for, for disaggregation. So th I think that's part of it. I think the other part of it is that because of those actions and because of the failure of so many efforts to desegregate, the public and the parents began to sour on desegregation as an outcome that would improve education for their kids. And so they began to turn to other things, whether it was vouchers or charter schools or other alternatives in order to get a quality education. I think what they probably don't realize um, is that segregation in its essence is not about the separation of kids in schools. It's about subordination. So what we learned in Kansas City was that as white students began to leave the Kansas City public schools and go into suburban schools around there, that the government of Kansas City remained the same in the hands of largely a white population. And once their kids left and went to the suburban area, Kansas City could not get any referendum passed. It's like, why are we gonna tax for these kids when they're not our kids? And that's one of the things about segregation that people don't understand. Now, that's one of the reasons the judge legislated, I mean the judge didn't legislate, the judge, I didn't know judge had this kind of power where a judge could levy a tax of $5 million on the state, $500 million on the state, so you gotta pay this uh, for Kansas City because they realized that the Kansas City schools had deteriorated because of that relationship. And so for that reason, I said, we can't just simply give up on the segregation because it's about more than kids being separate, racially separate, it's about the policies, it's about taxes, it's about what schools get supported uh, and who get the good schools and who end up with the bad schools. Uh, it's, it's really that complex, and so, and we have to, another thing I learned is that, that uh, even in school districts was try to justify school segregation based on some boundaries or some river or some dividing line, and once you ask the question, well, why are the teachers segregated? They can drive anywhere. <coughs> and no school district had an answer for that, is that they were also signing <coughs> black teachers to black schools and so forth, and you go, that's why we can't give up on the segregation because to give up on it uh, in one sense is to almost concede to a kind of apartheid in our educational system from students all the way up to teachers and superintendents and principals to where people are signed. At the same time, uh, I'm not opposed at all to other alternatives. You can't sit, what every parent knows is that you don't get a second chance when your kids go through. They have to get a good education then and there because they don't get a do-over. And so they can't wait on some changes to occur while their kids are going through. And so we have to work with parents uh, in every way possible to get the best education for their kids, even as we continue to challenge some of the results of, this, of segregation. So you, you mentioned um, uh, the Milligan v. Bradley case, mm -hmm. um, and in his opinion, Associate Justice Thurgood Marshall, um, he said that um, unless our children begin to learn together, there's very little hope that our people will ever learn to live together. And yet, that was 1974, mm -hmm. so decades later, um, shifting from uh, desegregation policy talk, there's now a lot of research around resegregation. Mm -hmm. And in North Carolina, um, we look at student assignment policies a lot, uh, Wayne County, Halifax County, all over the state. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about what you see. Uh, oh, there's still a hundred, over 100 school districts across the South that are still under federal desegregation orders. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering what you see as the School of Education's role. You mentioned feeling home in these schools. So I'm, I'm wondering what you see as the School of Education's role in either remedying some of that or speaking to to these issues because a lot of times those discussions veer into political dialogue which mm -hmm. are oftentimes forbidden so i'm curious what you see as either professor's role or the school as a whole yeah and there's always been political dialogue around the segregation whether it was the busing in boston and sure. actually um i saw him have to kind of if not apologize to rethink it, because when Joe Biden was coming up as a politician, he was very much opposed to busing. Um, and there are a lot of political stances on things like that that have occurred over a long period of time. But as educators, as we, when we look at it, we're looking at 
are there ways in which students are deprived of a good quality education? And we have to constantly speak to that. If that means the segregation, if that means uh, other forms, what well, busing, whatever it means to get equality and a good um, quality of education, uh, we continue to speak to that. I mean, let politicians do their thing because you know, they're trying to get elected and they might say anything. And they will say one thing at one time and something very different uh, again. But we have to, and I, I will borrow from the civil rights um, mantra, keep our eye on the prize. And that is on the quality of education of the students. I think we should always speak to that. Um, and um, we can't, I think there was a Supreme Court decision on vouchers. Uh, Clarence Thomas cited my book in support of vouchers. <laughs> And I was like, uh, <laughs> I was like, he was, I was talking about Sabbath schools and free schools in 1865, Mr. Thomas. If we are now in 2015, whatever. It's been, been a long time since then, and we're not just out of slavery anymore, and what's appropriate then. So people will say anything to support their particular stance. Educators, we have a, we take an entirely different view. We're not trying to politicize the situation. We're not trying to get elected. Uh, we're not trying to build a rationale against the opposition. We're really looking at our schools and the quality, the students, the teachers, the principals, and superintendents, and whatever we think we need to do uh, to improve that quality, we should always speak to it and not be afraid. Mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. So what do you think, how do you, what is the best way to bridge these kind of policymakers and these educators together? Because obviously that's, that's one of the places there's a disconnect. So how do we mm -hmm. create a better community in, in your profession? Well, <clears throat> I, you know, I, I find this interesting being in Illinois. Uh, I don't know how do you see it. When we tried to get in contact with legislators about a comp, not, we, didn't, we weren't trying to influence the legislators. What I really want to get across to them, that unless the state create some forgivable loans or some kind of scholarships for the best of our high school graduates to go and become teachers and not have to spend the rest of their life paying off a debt, you're not going to resolve the shortage. You know, you're asking people to live a substandard living in order to educate your kids. That's not a good bargain. That's all I want to talk to them about. But we got a call from government relations saying you need to go through presidential administration to talk to legislators because we don't want colleges or universities talking directly to legislators. Well, if you don't want us talking as dean or as faculty, how do we get the expertise of an education research community to the people who have to make policies about our schools? How do we get that? And we got to figure out a way to do that. You know, we can't sit there and hope that they hear about it. Uh, and sending them an article to read. <laughs> you know, my colleague, this is interesting, my colleague Bill Trent and I, um, the Black Caucus in Illinois State Assembly, and that's another thing too that is not good for our progress. They have a Latino caucus and a Black Caucus and both concerns about the dis discrimination against that <laughs> black and brown kids, but you know, we need a lot more coalition in that to get things done. But anyway, they had read a report on African Americans in STEM fields that came out of George Washington University, I believe. So then they got in the huff. Like, what's happened at the University of Illinois? Yeah. So they called the president. The president called me. I said, well, I'll go over and I'll take your know, alum, William Trent, with me because he had a five-year National Science Foundation uh, project just on that question. And so we got together and drove over there and walked into the room where we were supposed to meet. There were like three people in the room. Others came in, oh, excuse me, I gotta go vote and I gotta go do this. And we looked at each other and go, this pretense to be interested is just that, a pretense. They happened to read something in the news and demanding that we respond, and we got over there, and we couldn't even have a serious conversation, and certainly not a sustained conversation. So that's a very good question. How do you have sustained conversation with the people who are going to make the policies, and going to legislate the mandates, who are going to 
tax and fund uh, and create, how do we have that kind of situation where they understand what colleges of education need in order to produce the number and quality of teachers? Because we have a report from the superintendents in the state, and it's not only about the shortage and how schools are having to close programs and, and courses because the shortage, but the point they really want to emphasize is that the quality on the part from the vantage point of the principals is much lower than what it used to be. So we're not dealing just with a shortage or quantity question. We're also dealing with a quality question. And they need to understand how and what we need to do to get top ranked students into the field of education who are dedicated to become the next generation of teachers and how they do so in, an, in a way that they can live and work at a level of decency. That's the conversation we need to have along with other kinds of conversation about how they are mandating curriculum and other kinds of changes that make no sense. Um, you know, hope, you know, but, but how do we have that conversation? We're not allowed in any way uh, to talk to them. You might be only careful what you wish, what you wish for. I know, I know. We're sitting down here yeah. negotiating the details of curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know there's a, there's a responsibility from the other side to get the kind of responsible and intelligent people who are willing to have the conversation as opposed to simply want to punish uh, educators or punish teachers or who are somehow angry at universities because we think we are the cradle of liberalism and we turn out people who vote against them. I mean, you, know, you can't have a conversation if you go in with those things at stake. Um, they need to be concerned about their schools and about the quality of education that young people get. Uh, and we are concerned, and that's the basis of which we should need to have that conversation and bridge the gap. Mm. Mm -hmm. I asked this question with no small amount of trepidation. Mm. Um, but you began your talk with um, the notion that advanced placement scores specifically lead to higher scores in TIMS and lead to college entrance, which I believe and agree with. My concern is that Let's take social studies class, advanced placement history, U.S. history. Mm -hmm. The way in which the exam is designed and the way in which the teaching is forced is oftentimes pedagogically, I would argue, and curricularly safe and avoids safe. Yes, sir. Yes. And mm -hmm. avoids issues of controversy, race, class, power, mm -hmm. gender, resistance. Mm -hmm. And so, part of my fear is that is that the type of on the school side level. Is that not going to fail to engender the types of engaged, critical, and dangerous citizens that we might need to engage in complex change at the state house level, mm -hmm. at the community level? Mm -hmm. But it leads to a possibly, and, and this is hard to talk about broadly because there's teachers everywhere who do things independently and differently. Mm -hmm. But as a system wide or a policy level, that that could lead to less than engaged and less than incredibly, less than, less than um, critically engaged or critiquing citizens. And well, I didn't know if you had a yeah. on that. That possibility is not only there. I think if we do what we're doing now, that's the likely outcome in some ways. Uh, and when I say AP, I don't mean that I have some kind of fetish for AP course. It doesn't have to. Be, it doesn't have to be AP to have the same kind of rigor, the same kind of problem solving, critical thinking uh, that needs to be in there, and that can be done around the subjects that you mentioned as well. Um, my view with the university is that what we should put online. We don't have to call it AP. We just want to make sure that if there's a student somewhere, and actually, <clears throat> I kind of got this idea from one of our faculty. Uh, you know Lisa Mandamaya, um, and her son is um, Latino, and very smart. He's in the university now, but when he was in high school, they asked him to go into AP course, and he told his mom, no, I'm not, that's not cool. My friends, I'd, I'd lose them. Uh, so he wouldn't. And so I asked her, I said, what if it was on his computer in the basement? She said, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, he loved that. You know? And I said, so why don't we do that? Why do we have to have it done the way we've done it always? Why can't we have it available to students on their smartphones in other places? And we don't have to hold to the AP standards <coughs> because we don't have to even call it AP. Um, but the other part of your question is so critical that the kind of changes we're going to need will only come from people who have a good civic education and who understand the nation 
as well as democratic values and norms. If they don't have that, um, we're going to have a difficult time approaching them because their angle of vision, their values and norms are going to be in another direction. And so if you have to convince someone why we need federal support, because we know states and local governments are not going to be able to do this, how long will we allow kids to be in these kinds of schools, and what kind of support do we need? You, you need that civic education. We've done it before. We did that with the WPA, Works Projects Administration. We did that all over America when we realized that you had to have the union at University of Illinois is a WPA building. That WPA building is everywhere because it's like, you know, we have the slave narratives because of WPA. Teachers were out of work. And they said, well, we can't have these teachers unemployed out of work. Can we find something? Why don't we have them to take down the slave narratives and pay them to do that? There are times and crisis in a nation's history where you need that kind of national support. But who understands that? Someone really has a good civic education uh, who understands uh, federalism, state government, when we need support from different areas. A lot of that, you know, my classic was, um, I forget that debate and I'm blocking on her name, but she was the one who said, I'm not a witch. Uh, I don't know if you remember that campaign. Yeah. Anybody, huh? Somewhere, was it in De Delaware? Delaware. Yeah. Mike Castle. yeah. It was in Delaware, and when she said, <laughs> I'm not a witch, I thought, if you have to, if you have to say that, you're already in trouble. Because <laughs> most people don't have to declare, I'm not a witch. But anyway, <laughs> in the debate, she was like, well, where is it in the Constitution that calls for separation of state and church? She's like, well, did, is, do you guys know something I don't know? And I thought, wow, what happened to civic education? Yeah. And I, I have to say this one about our president. <laughs> He said, did you know that Lincoln was a Republican? He said, a lot of people don't know that. He said, I bet people didn't know that. And I was like, you just found out. <laughs> you know, these are just, these are, this is not what you're talking about, but I'm talking about a, a foundation in civic education that looks at issues of race, of gender in this country. Uh, the discrimination and the crisis that we're having, I mean, what we're having now, you know, reflects a lot of uh, poor understanding, poor civic education. And I'm not saying education understanding <coughs> leads to all of this or solve all of this, but underneath it, it would <coughs> provide us with some common basis to talk about government, about norms, about values, and so forth. Um, so, yes, um, uh, I worry that our students come through we're seeing this with this whole controversy on a number of things, whether it's the monuments or others, where in civic education, they really don't know what this is all about. Um, and they can't understand why people are upset or what it means or so forth. And in the meantime, uh, we are competing with social media where people are being disinformed all the time. Mm. Can I just mm -hmm. raise a point? So I, I want to continue on with Brian's point just for a second. It seems to me that one of the things that some that a lot of us are concerned about is the fact that, and you raised the social studies classroom, mm -hmm. but one of the things I'm concerned about is that civic education isn't just for social studies right, teachers, right. right? And we don't have a lot of democracy in schools. There's not a lot of choice for teachers. There's not a lot of choice for, for students. I mean, uh, I think you and I and Cheryl and other people, we'd agree that you have to, I mean, there has to be practice for all of this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so we've got to figure out a way in our own curriculum, not only with, you know, in the School of Ed, but, you know, in, with teachers, to give them the practical kinds of examples and, and experiences that, in a sense, teach those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I agree wholeheartedly, because it's almost like, the, you know, we're seeing this with the humanities on campus where, um, issues of ethics and other things come up and I'm thinking yes yeah, okay to take a course in the humanities but if you're in the school of business and the only place you understand ethics is when you go over to the humanities it has to be in <laughs> yeah and so you know it has to because you, you that's what's going to guide you and that's how you're going to form your views about how you should operate out there in the business world um, so um, and we're seeing a lot of ethical situations before us um, 
and where people um, seem not to even understand that they were violating, um, you know, ethical um, rules and, 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 and principles. So I agree, it can't, this is one place you get it, but that can't be, it has to be across in a number of ways.